Hey, Keto Freaks, here's an update on Keto Fest. We have a date, the weekend of July 15th and 16th, 2017. Keto Fest is a ketogenic festival for everyone, not just doctors and nutritionists. Richard Morris and I, along with a host of keto rock stars, are turning the entire coastal town of New London, Connecticut, ketogenic the entire weekend of July 15 and 16. Some of the best minds in keto have already said they want to come and speak, including Jimmy Moore, Megan Ramos, Ivor Cummins, Dr. Jeff Gerber, Dr. Eric Westman, and Dr. Ted Naiman. We'll have an outdoor food festival with live music, fitness lessons, cooking lessons, walking tours, bike tours, Segway tours, movies on the historic Guard Theater's 60-foot screen, and of course, great talks by our rock stars. We'll be doing a Kickstarter campaign soon to sell tickets. Meantime, go to KetoFest.com and register. KetoFest, real keto for real people. Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris. And normally I'm in Canberra, Australia, but today I'm in New London, Connecticut. <laughs> That's right. Sitting right across from me at Pwop Studios. Exactly. And I've been on a ketogenic diet for almost three years. And when I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. And within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've also lost about 80 pounds, and I've completely turned my health around. And this show is both a document of my progress through ketosis and Richard's experience thriving for years in oh, nutritional yeah. ketosis. <laughs> and hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. Yeah. We're not doctors. We don't want to give anyone any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nah. Yeah, we've done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we hope to share some of that research. Where possible, we intend to put links in the show notes to cite research supporting any claims that we make. You'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook, and we love to eat. We do. As witnessed by the dirty kitchen this week at my house. <laughs> Every episode, we both share a keto recipe that cannot be ignored. We sure do. So, let's start podcast number 55, Sitting Down with Gary Fetke, part, part one. one. <laughs> well, Richard, last show was a repeat. Uh, it was mad as hell, so I don't think we have any new uh, errata, do we? No, I. My only apology is for giving people a uh, a repeat. Yeah. Uh, but we were in flight. We were traveling from low carb Breckenridge, and we were getting ready to do some work on Keto Fest here in New London, Connecticut. Yep. Uh, but we did get some great stuff in the can while we were in Breckenridge, including what you're going to hear today, yeah. uh, which we're going to play the first part of our interview with Gary. But yes, it was a great week. Uh, we were busy getting a lot of content for you. So now over the next few weeks, you're going to hear everything that we, we got there. So let's start with what a ketogenic diet is. Sure. It's a diet with less than 20 grams of sugar or starch, a minimum amount of protein, and we get all of our energy from fat. Yes. Either fat on our plate yep. or fat on our body. That Maybe that Krispy Kreme that you ate a decade ago. <laughs> That's right. And uh, you can only access that body fat by getting your carbohydrates low, getting your insulin low. Yeah. And uh, that's exactly what we do. That's it. So pretty much this whole intro is going to be how was your week because we haven't <laughs> talked to anybody since Low Carb Breckenridge. No. And what a great time that was. Oh, it was amazing. We had an entire house uh, with uh, low carb people. Yep. We were all cooking. All of us were I guess pretty good cooks. We, yeah, we love cook. All love cooking. Yeah, and uh, the food was just so good. Oh yeah, and we had a couple of famous guests come over and share our 
our dinners Mm -hmm. and uh, we recorded a few podcasts, but really our our main reason for going there was to meet all these famous uh, low carb people. Right. We had a great week. And we saw some amazing talks too, which we'll we'll talk about some more. We will. But um, so one night in Breckenridge, we, uh, Richard made cabbage, I made Cuban pork, Mm. both of which have been in our recipe archive before and we've talked about them on the show. And we had Gary and Belinda Fetke over for dinner. We did, yeah. And it was great. We we had a great talk at dinner. All we wanted to do was sit around and talk to Gary after dinner. Yeah. And then, you know, it's about 9 o'clock before we said, hey, you know, we should do this podcast thing. <laughs> so we had a little video studio makeshift set up in the basement. Sure. And Gary came down and we talked to him. So here's half of that interview. Mm. And we'll do the second half next week. And we're going to take the whole thing in a couple of weeks and put it on YouTube as a video. As a behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. So here is the first half of our conversation with the great Gary Fetke. Gary Fetke, it's an honor to have you here with us today. Yes. I wanted to meet you guys. Thank you. Oh, well, we're just a couple of dudes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm just an orthopedic surgeon trying, trying to do the right thing. Oh, that is such a loaded statement. (laughs) We have so much to talk about. But first, I want you to uh, tell everybody about your your history. Briefly. (laughs) Nothing's ever brief in in, uh, in life. Uh, Look, um, I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Tasmania in Australia. Uh, I've got my own personal story, but as an orthopedic surgeon, I look after most of the diabetic foot complications in northern Tasmania. And it's messy. It's out of control. Diabetes is out of control. And part of that's my story. Uh, Obesity is out of control. The complications of lifestyle-related disease are confronting me, confronting the system every day. That's my story too. Yeah, I almost still lost a toe. I had a doctor tell me that might have to come off. And And you paid attention? I I had to pay attention. I was terrified and I... uh, I really, I, ha- I, I turned myself around and, and really looked into what it was that was causing my problems. And uh, thanks to uh, some of the work that you did with the, the videos that you've done and, and Tim Noakes and other uh, luminaries who are very yeah, I didn't even realise I was part of your story. Yes, you were. And I'm very grateful. I'm, thank you very much. Well, I mean, that's the, that's the cool side about all of this. And, yeah. and whether or not it's um, the internet uh, or what I call e-health or social media, mm. and, the ability to help people beyond your own practice is excellent. I mean, yeah. I know that with the social media that we've been doing, that I will potentially have the reach of helping more people in one blog mm. than I will in the entire lifetime to see people opposite me. Wow. Yeah. yeah, I know that's definitely been my story as well. Um, I've... I wasn't to the point where I was going to lose a toe, but my doctor gave me the diagnosis of diabetes and Richard uh, had cheated death and uh, bragged about it on Facebook. And I said, I want some of that. Um, But the real thing is reach of the internet is what it's really all about. Um, As a technologist, I could do classes, making a lot of money, teaching 20 people at a time. But how much reach do you have that way? You know where you. Can... Well, it has a flow-on effect, but nothing like what we what yeah. we can achieve now. Yeah. And certainly, my learning has come because of the internet and social media and the yeah. networking. Yeah. You know, like with Tim Noakes and Tim inviting me across to Cape Town a couple of years ago. Sure. Yeah. Um. You know, not only was it an honour, it was just it was a learning experience. And this meeting we're doing here in in Breckenridge is. I mean, I know all the speakers, and some yeah. I haven't met before. Yeah. yeah. But there hasn't been a lecture that I haven't learned something. Mm. You know, and supposedly I've got an understanding of this, but I'm still learning and we all are. But I mean, you come, you, when you go to a surgeon, that, that is a crisis point for a patient. So yeah. it's a really good point timing-wise for me to be potentially intervening in their That's overall point, care. Yeah. And I don't like just being a surgeon. I mean, mm. one of the things I much prefer doing is actually thinking, okay, what can we do to give you the tools to make yourself better? Yeah. And uh, I mean, my history. Twenty five years ago, I wouldn't operate on smokers if you were came along for elective surgery, and everyone said I was a redneck. But I said, look, here's the science. The early science is here. Yeah. And I'm one of the first surgeons in Australia to not operate on people if they're too heavy. Mm. But rather than tell them to go, go away, lose weight, which is a standard thing. Right. 
that's where part of my understanding has come in. Where is the role of low carb, healthy fat living? Right? Yeah. And it started off with sugar and then the oils and then the, the carbs over time. Uh, and then that's really empowered my patients to do something with that. But I don't want to be giving individual advice. I mean, I talk with my arms going and you know, mm. big picture stuff. Yeah. And then we opened up Nutrition for Life where we had dietitians or we have dietitians and a diabetes nurse educator who do all that individual stuff because that's beyond the scope of my day-to-day practice. I'm sure. just like, hey, look, you know, you've got diabetes, you're out of control, you're carrying too much weight, yeah. you've got an arthritic knee, mm. you need an operation. I think the concept of low carbs here for you. Right. It's based on, you know, good science and the CSIRO right. are of now, you know, adopting it and coming out publicly about yeah. it. How about you go along and see some dietitians who are, and you know, and you know, and as a result, you know, part of all that is I've gotten myself into trouble with all sorts of things. So that that opens up a big can of worms. Uh, for those who don't know, we did a show talking about Gary. We did. Uh, it was called Mad as Hell. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, we <laughs> yeah, told you your were mad, story. But I can tell you how mad I was. Oh, oh I yeah. still am actually. Oh yes. yeah. Yeah. So in a nutshell, you were told you can't do that. You can't tell people to do uh, heal themselves with nutrition. You're not qualified to do that. I am, do not have the medical qualification to advise people on nutrition. And essentially what you're saying is you can't tell – what they're saying is you can't tell people not to eat sugar. Well, I've been reported a couple of times and each time it's been by a dietitian. Mm. There's never been a case of patient harm. There hasn't been a patient complaint. There hasn't been a doctor complaint. There's not, none of that. Yeah. And I've kept saying, look, where is the case of patient harm? Right. Um, and so this investigation got underway and I wrote in and I've – Tim Noakes, his hearing has been very public. Yeah. Mine's been behind closed doors. And part of the criticism, and it continued to flow on into a Senate inquiry and full investigation, is that if you're under investigation by the medical board in Australia, yeah. you have no advocate, you have no ability to respond to what's actually happening behind closed doors. So, you you know, you're pretty well – you don't know what's happening. Do you even get to see the proceedings? No, no. And, you know, the things which are sent on to you, uh, the wording's changed, it's interpreted by one person. And, I mean, I've got documents where they've written one thing and then they've supplied me with the original and it's completely separate wording and with a different nuance. Yeah, somebody's interpretation just happened to – the person who happened to communicate it to you. Yeah. Um, Look, I haven't been an angel. I have poked the system. I mean, because yeah. we have to look at change. Yes. We can't wait for the system to change. You, there's so many diabetes is out of control, obesity is out of control. And if you don't let people know that there's another option out there, mm. I mean, there's so many people who have tried every diet underneath the sun. And all we're talking about now is here eating real food. Right, indeed. And the science of eating real food is that it is low in sugar. Yeah. It is not processed and it's not made up with unhealthy processed oils. Right. And you should eat fresh, local and seasonal. It's remarkable to me that a doctor can say something like that and all of the dietitians in the world would be arrayed against you. I mean, well, I mean it begs it's, belief. It's <laughs> unbelievable. Because it's been given a label, yeah. low-carb, healthy fat, sure. people go, oh, that's a fad diet. I'm yeah. saying, no, no, that's yeah. a description of eating real food, which is fresh, local and seasonal. And the reality is the standard diet the western diet is the fad diet the mm. carbohydrate that's, the processed food that's the fad yeah we, we've been eating this fad diet for 40 years mm. and you know i talk about the food pyramid as it's sort of standing or variations of it and i say look if you're going to eat by the food pyramid and live by the food pyramid then you're going to die by the food pyramid and Indeed. along the way you're going to look like the food pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> and but that's true yeah and i i used to do that so my own health journey i was a fat kid mm-hmm. i was raised on sugar carbs refined carbs and yeah. polyunsaturated oils the margarine all of that i i remember my grandmother used to give us uh white bread Cut, uh, smeared with margarine and white sugar with the with the crusts cut off. Yeah, and hundreds of thousands. And hundreds of thousands. And it, that wait, was, wait, 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 wait. What's hundreds of thousands? Oh, I, um, brightly sprinkles. coloured sprinkles. Oh, oh. sprinkles. And this, this, and, and my mother, my mother says to me that this. My grandmother did this, and and uh, she's my first grandparent to pass away, and so I don't remember her that well. But my mother says that was how she showed love. Yeah. Yes. And because these were very in her era, these were very refined and very um, elegant foods. Mm. And, of course, 
now white bread, white uh, margarine, and white sugar are uh, trash. <laughs> you know? But I mean, that's you know, we talk about this. You know, I understand now roughly how food drives behavior, yeah. the chemistry. Mm. But then you've also got how it's marketed, mm. and then you've got a whole culture of you know you can't go to a party now without having a cake. Sure. And so you know that's part of this whole mm. thing about changing lifestyles. And when mm. people say, "Oh, it's a diet," I'm going, "No, we've got to look at the whole thing. Right. You've got to learn about how the food's going to drive behaviour. You've got to understand that when you go to a party, when some people shoving you something underneath you." you you know, you, you need you to be able say, to say no. You can say no, yeah. Right. You can learn how you to tell say your no. Kids to mm. say no to drugs too. I mean, but That's it, right. it's the same idea. And then when you go to the shops, you know, actually understand that you know that brightly coloured package is there to draw your eye. Yeah. So you're mm. going to pick it up and buy it. Mm. You know, talking about reading labels. So it's all about learning the tools of actually eating real food, which is not that simple. Yeah. So, so what is the status of your what do you, what do you call it? A censure? Uh, what did they do exactly? So it started off as a you know a, a complaint put in by a dietitian, right? And then the investigation went on for two and a half years, and then there was another complaint put in uh, where I was um, uh, accused of um, uh, inappropriately, effectively reversing someone's type two diabetes. <laughs> How inappropriate of you! <laughs> and, oh, you've got to be kidding! Yeah. And, um, Wait a minute, but is that the actual word that, on the complaint? The, inappropriately yeah, curing yeah, I think inappropriately claimed to have cured, or reversed someone's type 2 diabetes. Oh, okay. <laughs> and okay, we did it on national TV, okay? And yeah. yes, we did. And I actually didn't do it. I just got, I mentored him. Yeah. But the team of dietitians and the diabetes sure. nurse educator, they did, they did all the work. But it was inappropriately for me to claim it. Not that I ever really did claim it. I mean, I just happened to be on TV with him. And you said, hey, this is what the blood sugar is. This is what the A1C is. Diabetes is a measure you, of you, A1C. You've no longer got diabetes. Yeah. No Congratulations. Yeah. And then in the same complaint, I was reported for what I was going to say at a hospital food industry meeting, a national one that I was invited to speak at. So you were convicted for a thought crime? Well, <laughs> well, this, this, this is the, well that, that's the concern, you know, if you – and obviously, I've challenged that, and uh, APRA still won't reply to that portion of it, <sighs> even though they actually asked me for a copy of my speech before I gave it. Incredible. <laughs> well, and I said no. Yeah. Because you know, you know what's happened if the if the system's actually censoring you to that point in time. Um, so anyway, the, the process has gone on. Um, I've effectively put in a. Uh, a thesis of information about, and ultimately they came back in a really, really badly worded document. Mm. And I've had legal opinion about that as well. It's not just my opinion. Um, but uh, it's ultimately said um, what I'm talking about might be right. Mm. And even if it's shown to be best practice, I'm not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> Insane. Are you, are, you, are, you, are you breaking the law right here? Right yes, now? I suspect yes. so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this hasn't been tested. Yeah. I mean, we're here in the United States. Sure. Yeah. Um, but and you're the, corrupting an Australian. So. <laughs> well, you know, if you're listening in Australia, don't listen, please. Yeah. No, no, uh, please don't. If, but it said that effectively, it has said that my qualifications as an orthopedic surgeon do not allow me to speak out about nutrition, either to my patients or to the community at large. Uh, and and particularly about diabetes. Right. Hmm. Which is but, but I've got a third of my patients. Yeah. And every operating list in the public hospital has a patient with diabetes which is poorly controlled. Perfectly okay for you to chop their yeah. feet off. But yet I can talk about you know, I've got all this knowledge now where I know that every single complication of diabetes is preventable. Yes. That's it. Yeah. You know, and we've been hearing about how it's reversible, yeah. but um, the complications of diabetes are avoidable. Yeah. That's it. And, and once you see the results of low carb in the management of diabetes and a whole range of other health things, you can't unsee them. It's yeah. something we talk about. So, you know, I sort of, we sort of say, you know, hashtag we can't wait, but we can't <laughs> wait yeah. to keep going you know, the way we are. And it's just not financially viable as a society. And it's certainly not independently viable for the person who I, you know, I need to see there in my office. Right? Yeah. 
Uh, absolutely. It's, it's, that's one of the reasons we started the podcast in the first place and we built the forums that we did um, was to try and build a groundswell of type 2 diabetics, understanding a little bit about their process, working out how to fix themselves and then taking it to their loved ones and their friends and family. And if everybody does that, if everybody takes responsible for two other people, then this thing can grow exponentially. The thing well, is, we didn't invent it. We, no, we didn't. <laughs> we don't have the only community. We, no. We're we just tapping into the people that are already doing it. There's, we know thousands of people, or we know of thousands of people who've done exactly what we've done, yeah. the same exact way and have the well, same exact well, My story is about me as well. I mean, I was a fat kid. Uh, as it turned out, I was pre-diabetic. Mm. Uh, I had my, my own cancer story. Uh, I've you got had brain cancer, didn't you? A pituitary tumour. Oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, so, it yeah, so it's on the base of the brain. Okay. And I needed to have surgery and chemotherapy and mm. radiotherapy, and I needed a second lot of surgery. And um, since I've actually gone hardcore at this, the thing stopped. <laughs> yeah. So I, that's why I've got an interest in cancer and, and the that. whole metabolism of it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm, so I've never said that nutrition will cure cancer. Right. But it. But it's a great adjunct. Yeah. To chemotherapy, radiotherapy, surgery, you know, the, the it's traditional. A good, it's a good way to stress it and to push it while well, you try well, other There's so much information out there and we've just heard two lectures today yeah. from, you know, an oncologist and a general physician uh, talking about the potential role and the role where it is actually in cancer management. And I gave a talk on this a couple of years ago. Mm. I got hammered for that one yeah. as well because I, I should, orthopedic surgeons shouldn't be talking about cancer. Well, I've got cancer. Yeah. Yeah. A whole lot of my patients have got cancer. Uh, again, I'm looking for tools that they may want to utilize. And I've never said cure. And, you know, and these are things that I've been accused of saying, mm. I know exactly what I've said and I know exactly what we've done on social media. And I'm, you know, I'm not stupid and we're quite careful about mm. it. But then to get accused of stuff and then I, there's a whole lot of things of what people think that I've said versus what I have said. And, and this is all the trouble with hearsay, rumour, innuendo. Uh, but again, if it, sure, I've copped a bit of a hammering in the last several months, but there have been more people now aware of, well, what's he being hammered about? Yeah. And, and it, a lot of us are willing to stand up and, and say, no of more. Course. I mean, this is, this is just, uh, it's incredible the, the bastardry of some of the act, acts that, um, you've had to put up with. I mean, you know, uh, people uh, you know, uh, abusing your locker at work and things like that. Which just, I mean, I heard about those. Does Doctor the- Oz have these problems? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't he like have a different theory of everything every week? And he, he can say whatever well, he wants. Well, I mean, maybe I, you should I, just get a TV show. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, I'm quite happy trying to pull my head down. I mean, the very my first medical degree. Uh, is MBBS, and I've questioned yeah. it. You know, since when does getting a second or a third degree nullify your first degree? Mm. And but I mean, I you know, I've, I've used this common sense logic. Mm. Yet we've got a system in Australia which uh, is getting reviewed at the moment. You know, in, in the Senate inquiry, uh, whether or not anything will come of that is yet to be decided. Mm. But it's a bit like low carb. This is no longer about me. You know, it, it never, it's never been about me. Low-carb, healthy fat has been about getting a message out there. Mm. And what this process of what has happened to me by the medical board and what we call APRA in Australia um, has shone a light into a, the fact that the system's not working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it, it's, um, you know, I'll be, I'll be careful and I'll say, I re, like, I respect the police yeah. and I respect the common law because that's something that's evolved over hundreds of years. What I can't respect is a system that can actually allow you to not a process which is actually just failing. Yeah. And it's not failing for me. I've now become aware of hundreds of stories, yeah. which doctors, dentists, nurses. Even know, dieticians. No, no, they don't, they're not under like the Jennifer umbrella. Of, no. Well, yeah, but that, or dieticians aren't under the umbrella of APRA. Oh, of course. Because APRA have deemed that dietetics is, doesn't require any supervision. Yes, it's, it's not dangerous. It's is, not I dangerous, think, yeah, so that, therefore... I find it incredulous that they're actually ruling upon me giving nutritional advice when they don't have any um, 
ability to jurisdict in that vicinity yeah. anyway. But then generally it's another story where mm. she's been caught up by her process by yeah. the Dietitians Association. And who were we talking about? Jennifer Elliott. Jennifer Elliott. Oh, Jennifer Elliott, yeah. And she's a New South Wales dietitian who's effectively lost her licence. Right. Um, to practice. And there's Jennifer's story and then there's the one of the Dietitians Association that's quite interesting how they're quite separate. But Jennifer's story has remained consistent and the mm-hmm. Dietitians Association one seems to have changed a bit. Mm, absolutely. I'll, I'll leave has. it at that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there are clearly forces at play that if you upset the cart, nobody's happy with it. Mm-hmm. And you know it's happened to Tim Noakes in in South Africa. It's happened to Karen Zinn as a dietitian in Anna Dahlberg in Sweden yeah. almost ten years ago. Yeah, but when it's been challenged on the science, it falls over. Yeah, yeah. It sure does. And yeah. and you know I suppose my problem is that I started talking about sugar six seven years ago. You know if I came out now as a you know doctor saying look you've got to cut back on your sugar, wouldn't be a problem. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And and the other thing was that in Australia. The process was um, was hidden. It was in a star chamber, whereas um, uh, Tim Noakes was able to. Hmm. It, it was Tim Noakes was able to uh, prosecute his defence. I, I haven't mm-hmm. been able to <clears throat> ask a question about the people, you know, from of the people that threw in the complaints. Do you uh, know who they are? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I, they were anonymous notifications. Yeah. But you didn't know for a while too, right? No. No. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they have an expert witness uh, who, um, I, you know, we can't cross-examine. Hmm. And I have said to them, you know, look, actually, I think you know, this is a biased opinion. And, you know, that person's giving, an opinion, you know, an opinion and advice on my qualifications, yet they've never gone to the uh, Australian Medical Council. They've never gone to the College of Surgeons. They haven't gone to the universities to find out what doctors can and can't talk about. Yeah. They've taken an opinion from someone associated with the food industry. I'm of sorry. I, you know, yeah. Just, yeah. And, you know, I realise this, you know, can, you know, but I'm happy to back every single statement that I've said. Mm. And, you know, that's, you know, I, I personally think there's a gross miscarriage of justice. Mm. However, I'm now aware of the fact that this same process of vexatious notifications, like if you've got it in for someone, then you can put a complaint in and that will, person will be tied up for months under investigation. So if you're after a job, let's say you're an anaesthetist, mm. you apply for a job at a mm. hospital, sure. 20 people apply, but I put a complaint in about you, you have to notify the potential employer that you're currently under investigation. Mm. And they'll say, look, 20 people here, this guy's under investigation, you could be guilty or not guilty, yeah. but you will not get that job. Yeah, yeah. of course. Until it's cleared. And... and it doesn't happen overnight. This takes months and months. Do you have any advice? Because you, you must know a lot of doctors that come to you and say, you know, uh, I know this is the right way to treat patients, but I'm afraid. And that's, that's I mean, from the, let's say from those people with vested interests who put in the complaint and uh, then the tactics work because I'm approached by many doctors and certainly even before it, mm. who were willing to, you know, starting to come out mm. and, you know, not only help their patients but refer on accordingly, yeah. um, who have then pulled their heads back down again because they go, oh, actually, I don't want that hassle. I yeah. just, I don't want it. I've got a young family. I've got a mortgage. I've got a career. Sure. Uh, and we're fortunate enough that our kids have left home. We feel very strongly about it. Mm. But then the Nutrition for Life Centre that we opened up, um, uh, you know, APRA came and said, look, I've got a vested interest in it. And quite clearly, we did mentor it, myself and my wife, Belinda. Mm. And, uh, but, you know, we've never made a dollar out of it. And I can tell you, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars we're down. Right. But APRA never did an audit. They just said, oh, you've got a vested interest, an undeclared conflict of interest mm. on social media. Um, as it turns out, I only referred 28 patients in, out of 1,100 in two and a half years, mm. you know, directly referred yeah. because I didn't want to be accused of that. Mm. And 88 doctors refer into that centre. So, wow. I mean, it's hardly that I'm the only person doing wow. that. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we were just about to start an educational program around Australia for training educators, myself, the diabetes nurse educator and the, and the dietitians to teach 
dieticians and doctors uh, and that whole thing had to be closed down, mm -hmm. which is sad because that was the next step. You know, if yeah. we really want to take education this, is really the not educating people, mm -hmm. but educating the educators. Right. Uh, we had a dean of medicine signed up to come along <laughs> to it. You know, yeah. I mean, how how cool was that? You know, mm -hmm. to not a, you know that this is cutting edge stuff which you guys know about. It's not rocket science though, but we no. had you know we've got a whole set of tools there to teach educators, and this is how you do it. This is the, you know. This is, you know, the images, this is the stuff you need to actually support people in, in their journey. So it's obvious that you have political and monetary influences that are working against you. What about just the... Well, you can say that, but I can't say mm. it publicly. I said it. Yeah. I don't care. <laughs> take my no money. I don't have any money that you can take, so I said it. Um, but it's clear to me, anyway, that yeah. that's what's happening. But what do you think about just the sheer power of sugar addiction that makes people not believe that this is possible do you think that there's anything like when when, when you find opposition to a low carb healthy fat diet from somebody who is otherwise really intelligent you know uh, some part of it has to come from oh i could never give up bread just like the whole how can you live like that you know they don't they can't well, foresee I th it i think there's there's a perspective as an individual and then there's a perspective as a health professional. And it's probably easier to take the health professional one first of all. Uh, how did I get it wrong? You know, did, yeah. How on earth did I actually miss this? Right. How did my education fail to actually teach me about this? Right. And so there is a bit of a den denial first of all. And I right. went through that. I went, and I, you know, one of the early books, not the first one I'd read – was uh, Sweet Poison by David Gillespie. David Gillespie, yeah. And I've, you know, I've spoken to David about it since. I tried to prove him wrong. I said, oh, no, <laughs> this guy's wrong. You know? <laughs> In the meantime, I'd cut my leg and I was putting my – I couldn't exercise. And I thought, well, whilst I'm trying to prove him wrong, I'll give it a crack and lost eight kilos <laughs> and over eight weeks. And without I've got, exercising. Without <laughs> exercising. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, I used to be the carb kid. Oh, he, he, here's, you know, I'll, um, a little scoop for you. Mm -hmm. I used to be the chocolate cake judge. At really? the hospital, <laughs> the cake judge at the hospital, and I would not take plasters off children or anyone unless they brought me a chocolate cake. Wow. Wow. Nice. So I am trying to redeem my sins. Okay? Yeah, I'm I'll bet. To, <laughs> there you go. Uh, so I tried to prove it wrong. So I went, and then you, and we see this with health professionals. That first of all, they go, "No, it can't be right." Yeah. And if I tell you you're wrong, yeah. mm. your very first response is, "No, nah. I'm right. You're <laughs> yeah. wrong." Right. So everyone gets a bit defensive. When they start working it out, you can actually see health professionals, they get angry. Yeah. And you, you probably, I don't know if you've seen them on social media. And Blinda and I will go, oh, he's in the angry phase. <laughs> They're yeah. in the angry phase now. Right. And then people go, actually, how can I do something? What can I do to help in this process? And I've had many doctors come to me and say, actually, I've gotten that wrong. How do I learn more? Mm. And then that's the time you support them. Yeah. What happens as an individual? Yeah. That's that's different. That's your own personal story. And I think mm. you get to a point in time, you get your diabetes, uh, I had my cancer, mm. you take an interest in your health. Uh, I talk about financial planning. You know, mm. like We plan for our financial retirement, sure. mm -hmm. but it's so rare for people to actually think consciously about their health retirement. Mm. And the benefits of planning for your health retirement can be compounded in a good way or in a bad way. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. And today's a good day to start planning for your health retirement. Yep. But I, I remember if I had heard that three years ago, I would have said, yeah, but pizza, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just such an overwhelming urge. You know that it's not right to eat what you think is a fatty meal, but, you know, really it's the carbohydrates. But yeah. people just they can't. Can't I remember finding it hard to imagine myself in the future where I didn't want to eat sugar and bread? You know what I mean? Yep. And I and I think that's just a hard thing to this, imagine. <clears throat> this is about education. I mean, once you know about it, then you can start making a choice. Yeah. Like I'm okay with smokers nowadays, mm. and I was, as I say, first surgeon to not operate on smokers for in front. Well, not the first, but a long time ago. Mm. But I'm okay if people want to smoke now because you've now, with all the information that's out there, you've made a conscious decision yeah. to be an idiot. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. I'm okay with it. You've made made but, an informed but, decision to be a, an idiot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll leave it at that. But if you, but if you want to make an informed decision about your eating, yeah, 
and what's good and bad. There's so much confusion There's out so there. So much garbage. Mm. And so, you know, where do you start? Yeah. So if someone is in that state of mind, the great thing now is people are starting to hear about sugar. Yeah. You know, they like, oh, sugar's not that good. Mm. I, I think that that's an easier sell than, you know, sugar is bad is an easier sell than fat is okay. And even fat is beneficial. I think people have a really hard time with that one. You've got to just wait for that that point. And, and when people become engaged in their health retirement or, you know, whatever, they've got a problem, mm. then you can start. And it is small, you know, very few people can go, Cold turkey, yeah. Do the full what I call the trifecta, you know, because I've you know I'm known for you know sugar makes you hungry, carbs make you fat, polyunsaturated oils make you inflamed and sick. Yeah. But yeah. The, uh, let's cut back on the sugar. You're gonna go. You're gonna go through you know, withdrawal. Switch from margarine to to butter. Mm. You know, switch from vegetable oil to olive oil. You know mm. the Mediterranean oils. What's there's nothing dangerous yeah. about healthy mm. healthy fats. We're not talking. I'm a great believer in not saying high fat. Yeah, yeah, healthy because fat, right? I've heard you say that before. And you, 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 you say that really it is a matter of eating real food. If somebody just eats real food, they will naturally be eating more fat and less healthy carbohydrate. Fats, yeah, yeah. The, more healthy fats. Yeah, yes. the cheese, the nuts, the avocado, mm. the, the fish, the Mediterranean oils. I mm. mean, we're not talking about deep fried Mars bars. No. You know, it's just right. It, it is just healthy stuff. And when you eat to satiety. Mm. You you don't you don't overeat because you you fill up. Um, I try and use a lot of visual stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I know when I, my new registrar start, well, you know, one of them will come in with a can of soft drink or fruit juice or whatever. Okay, guys, good. Let's uh, let's get the same amount of sugar mm -hmm. in the water yes. Yeah. Yes. that you've got there. Okay, now yeah. drink it. Yeah. And they can't yeah. Because, yeah. because it's awful. Yeah, it's all right. And there's a whole lot of science about what's been done to that soft drink to yeah. actually make it palatable. Yeah. Um, that's Damon Gamow's trick, the teaspoons of sugar that he, he yeah. equates all of his foods yes. to sugar cubes. And uh, that's, a, that's a brilliant visual aid. But, but, and we use a lot of that with education. Mm. Uh, or we used to be, it wanted to. But yes. <laughs> um, the... Uh, but you know, but actually getting them to drink it—that's mm. the hard yakka. And the other one is to, um, uh, I'll sometimes use it's just plain pasta. You, mm. you think you like pasta, so we just boil it up without any salt. Just eat pasta. It's boring. It's not you know? nice. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> or you know, and effectively we're talking about beige. You know, I realise the walls yeah. here are beige. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not very exciting. So no. let's skip all the beige food and go for all the coloured stuff, which gives all the textures a. Well, what do we like best about potatoes? The butter, the sour cream, the bacon, the chives, like all the salt. That's it's, what it's I like. It's not the potato. To, it's certainly not yeah. potato. Well, I, you know, pizza is a classic example. I'm the guy that will go along and scrape all the topping off. Yeah, yeah. And I'll too. go, look, this is fine. You, if you want to eat the pizza bases. It's the plate. <laughs> that's the, yeah, that's, that's the plate the pizza comes on. Comes on. <laughs> and, right. and um, you know, but using visual things like that gives yeah. people a bit of an understanding about it. To be continued. Next week. Yeah. Don't miss it. Uh, well, Richard, that brings us to... Recipes! <laughs> Recipes! Recipes. <laughs> I love this microphone. It's great, isn't it? <laughs> you got to have a booth like this in your house. Yeah. You know? People, Carl has the most professional studio, and yeah. if you're thinking that doesn't sound like Richard, that's because uh, Carl's studio is making me sound a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, where's your echo? I don't know. I have no echo. Yep. So we thought we might uh, share some recipes from Low Carb Breckenridge, from the meals that we've cooked. That's right. And these were meals that we cooked that we haven't yet put on the show. Right. But they are on the ketogenic forums. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So I'll go first. This is Louise Reynolds' salmon frittata. Oh, that was good. Yeah, it was, wasn't it? <laughs> And this is uh, one that we made when Ivor Cummins came over yeah. for dinner. We didn't get a podcast with him, but no. we had a great dinner. We've had so many podcasts with Ivor before. He's yeah. very generous with his time. So. Yeah, he was. Mm -hmm. All right. So what you're going to need is 300 grams of smoked salmon. Mm. I love smoked salmon. Oh, yeah. One bunch of trimmed asparagus or substitute with canned spears. Mm -hmm. Blah. Don't do that. <laughs> no. 200 grams of camembert which is like brie. Yeah. If you can't find camembert, use brie. Mm -hmm. Eight eggs and two-thirds of a cup of cream. 
And of course, you know, salt and pepper to taste. But yeah. step one, preheat the oven to either 180 Celsius or 375 Fahrenheit. You layer the smoked salmon over the base of a greased pan. Uh, and she has the dimensions of 17 by 25 centimeters by four centimeters deep. You know, some sort of oven-proof dish. Yeah. Of course, you know. Pyrex you, dish or something like that. Yeah, of course. A Pyrex dish of, of any size, so long as it's not so big that mm. it turns into a very thin layer. So you lay out the asparagus. Over the top of the salmon. Exactly. And you range it over the smoked salmon and top it with the sliced camembert. Ooh. Now you whisk the eggs and cream together with salt and freshly ground pepper. So that means you're going to have to taste it, mm. you know. And you pour that over the mix, the camembert on top, bake it for 30 to 35 minutes or until puffed and golden. Yeah. Mm. And then take it out, set it aside for five minutes to cool just a little bit before you serve it. And let me tell you, that was amazing. Wasn't it? And the edges sliced evenly. Yeah. Often with the uh, a lot of these uh, low-carb recipes, they don't hold together as well. And so, you know, you really have to slice it with a spoon. But yeah. this was, you know, a sharp knife and the edges held together lovely. Right. So it was delicious. It had the consistency of cake, really. Yeah. 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 Really. Amazing. So, Louise Reynolds, thank you very much for cooking that, first of all, and yep. then sharing the recipe and uh, you can find it on our forums. Yep. Thanks, Dr. Lou. Dr. Lou. So I've got a recipe from Brenda Zorn, and she got that recipe from Kim Dinnis, and it's on the ketogenic forums. And the recipe is, and, and we made this when Ivor was, Ivor was here, and mm. he raved about it. Oh, yeah. In fact, I think Brenda made multiple versions. She made it twice, yeah. Yeah, it was so popular. So uh, this recipe is a pecan maple tart. Yeah. And it's from Kim Dinnis. And it's on our forum, and we'll put the links in the show notes. Yep. And Kim says that her pecan uh, uh, tart starts with a base, and you really start with a cup of almond flour, 30 grams of melted butter, and a little bit of sweetener, 10 grams of truvia is enough. Mm -hmm. And basically, you want to melt the butter, uh, add the almond flour to it, add the sweetener to it, and get it into like a ball in the bottom of your pot, and yep. then you take it out and you... You put it on a glass uh, Pyrex dish, mm -hmm. and you flatten it out. And I, I often use like a the bottom of a of a glass to 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 push it into all, all of the corners and to flatten it out. But right. basically, what's going to happen now is you're going to bake this in the oven for ten to fifteen minutes until it's light brown, uh, probably 180 Celsius uh, oven, and uh, also 375 degrees Fahrenheit. That's right. Yeah, and then you leave it to cool. So you basically Bake it until it's a light brown color, and then you leave it to cool. And it's really just butter and almond flour, so yeah. it's going to be delicious. It's going to be delicious. <laughs> <laughs> so now the filling is going to be a cup, uh, around about 90 grams of chopped pecans. Yeah. Um, you want 100 grams of butter, and you want 70 grams of truvia. Yeah. And so you want to heat a pan and melt the butter, add the truvia, and when it starts to bubble, you throw in the pecans, stirring continually. Mm. And Optionally for a maple flavor, you can add about a teaspoon of maple extract and about one-eighth of a cup of zero-calorie maple syrup. Mm. Uh, that's an option. Pecan maple is delicious. <laughs> yeah, it is. A pecan sweet butter, I mean, mm. anything It's going to be. You don't even need the maple, but it just sends it over the edge, it does doesn't it? does send it over the edge. Yeah. So basically what you do is you've got a, a preset base that's been cooled now. It's been cooked and cooled. You pour the filling into the base and you leave it to set in the fridge. Mm -hmm. And that's it. And uh, hey, this was so good. It was so delicious. Oh. So I think she used uh, an erythritol stevia blend. I think it was Swerve, wasn't it? Right, yeah. And she dialed back the uh, sweetener a little bit. The second time. Yeah, so Brenda says when she made it for our dinner party at the Two Kilo Dudes Party House in Breckenridge, uh, she used one quarter less sweetener uh, mm. because it was a little bit sweet. Right. So I think you can probably uh, do that to taste. You know, yeah, if, I think if so too. First time you do it, it's a little bit sweet. Just dial that back a little bit. But uh, let me tell you, it was like crack candy. We couldn't <sighs> stop good? eating it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little bit of whipped cream over the top. Oh, man. <laughs> so that's our recipe for the day. And we hope you enjoyed this uh, part one of our interview with Gary Fetke. Come back next week for part two. Mm. And after part two goes online, we will have the whole entire video interview on YouTube.
Yeah. Of course, if you have anything that you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something that you don't agree with, or some more research that you found to support or refute anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at twoketodudes.com or post it on our website. Yeah. And you can follow us on Twitter at Two Keto Dudes, on Instagram at Two Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join our forum, it's www.ketogenicforums.com or forum.twoketo.com. And if useless swag is your fancy, you know, t shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, head over to gear.twoketo.com. Yeah, and if you feel like supporting our podcast or our forums, hit the donate button on our website at www.2ketodudes.com or just go to donate.2keto.com. You can also see our podcast and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. All right, that's the show. Keep calm and keto on, Richard. Yeah, keep calm and keto on, Carl. Awesome. We'll see you next week on, on 2 Keto, keto Dudes. dudes.